Hello, 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 and welcome back. This is my very last talk on the subject of Charles Dickens' novella, A Christmas Carol. It, it concludes my weeks of reading the novella on the run-up to Christmas, and we are now at December 13th, Sunday, and we're going to take a final conclusion, an overview of the, um, the book itself and its characters and its inner, inner meaning with a hope to be providing a thorough look at all the stuff we've read through over the past five, six weeks. Um, I have to say it's been a very good process. I've enjoyed doing it a great deal. And the reason why I've enjoyed it has been because it has been a, a really fun thing to be involved in. And people's feedback has been quite funny, especially those who have commented on me having a, a, a northern or northeastern accent. So uh, every so often <laughs> we've had a Geordie, Mr. Scrooge. And a Jody Bob Cratchit. But you know, it's one of those books that though it's set in a big city, we assume to be London, uh, and it's nearly always set in London, it doesn't actually say much about the whole business of which particular town it is. So you could have it in any particular uh, city within the UK. Um, in the 1840s when this particular book was written and when it was set. It's certainly set at the height of the rise of industrialised capitalism as Britain's industrial revolution really comes to its peak. And this is the first thing, again, we need to say about A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol has multiple flavours to it as you read through the book. It is a political book. I think I've said that once before, or especially when we first started reading it, that this is a political book and it works on the basis of protesting against the treatment of the very poor by the very rich at the time when industrial riches were growing through business and through productivity and through mass production and the changes in the way in which employment and life operated throughout the UK but in particular the big industrialised cities of the North and the Midlands and London in particular where industrialisation had changed the face of, of humankind in the 60 years since around about 1780 right the way through to the 1840s and in that process in that, that process of change what had largely been a craft based uh, small business based and agriculturally based economy suddenly became one of big businesses industrial settings factories and the kind of employment we now kind of take for granted it you know when Christmas Carol was being written, Dick Dickens was describing starvation wages employment, which later on became quite kind of average throughout the UK. And to a certain extent, though it's not starvation wages anymore, you can still see the same features of it in the early 21st century. It's interesting that in 200 years of, of since you know, more, nearly 200 years since the book was written, we still don't have that, that you know, haven't sort of sorted out the issues that, that, that Dickens tries to protest over within, within his book. Another aspect of the, of the book is its differentiation of social strata within society. Dickens makes it pretty clear that there are massive differences between the poor and the rich. And the rich and poor are noted not just by the, 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 the money they have, but also the way in which they live their lives. So throughout the book, 
there is often a return to the business of either the the strange <laughs> strange thought of of the, the the beloved working class the working the the doughty working class person who who is morally good and and hard working and but is badly paid and then of course there is the other aspect of of the working class namely the criminal classes and you see the two mixed up together in in dickens's book as uh, as aspects of what he later on produces in 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 during the period when he uh, introduces the ghost of christmas present and especially the business of those two children who are the core of the of the political message uh, want and ignorance want the children of the ch children who are want and ignorance represent these aspects of society the ignorance in terms of people who have you know no no better than to live the lives they do because they have not gained any anything the way, way of education and want in the sense that people at, at during this period could live in absolute poverty grinding poverty and you can see that in in the, these two representative symbolic children the other aspect of course is is bob cratchit himself bob cratchit is is the the worthy industrial man looking after his family it's not a particularly big family which is interesting isn't it it's not a large family he has got what uh two sons two daughters as far as i can remember which for a, for a, an, an industrial family at this period particular period of time would have been very small usually you would expect to see a family of uh, maybe eight nine kids because of the nature of the way in which uh people had children because they could go out to work and could help support the family so you know it wasn't just the business of nothing much to do on the evenings because it's because there's no tv but also the whole business of being part of a society in which which children work almost a pension insurance policy for, for for adults as they grew older so we have these various symbols we have bob cratchit the symbol of the the doughty working class individual who does his best for his family is is honest and reliable and you know gives a day's pay for a uh, gives a day's work for a day's pay and is is a kind of like symbol of the of the conscience of the work of the working population and then you have of course who, who, you know the, the, the anti-hero of the entire book ebenezer scrooge himself and scrooge is here to, to demonstrate some of the worst aspects of industrial ownership and business he is a liberal not a neoliberal he is a liberal. He is a, a, a kind of Benthamite liberal. He is a kind of Lockean liberal. He has almost a, an American style liberal because Scrooge believes in one thing, and that is the idea of one supports oneself. One does not ask for charity. One does not beg for charity. One does not give charity because to give charity is as bad as begging for it. And therefore, at the end of the day, one was dependent on oneself to see oneself through the whole business of living a life. Scrooge is the symbol of industrial, relentless self-sufficiency. He is a bad man, not because of the fact he goes goes out of his way to be to be to be a bad person. He's not evil because of the nature of himself, but because of the situation in which he finds himself and the philosophy. He's grown, grown up with this idea of self-reliance being at the heart of early 19th century industrial society. So Ebenezer Scrooge is a symbol of early 19th century industrial society and, and Dickens' book is a critique of that process. Dickens's book is also symbolically religious but not in the kind of overt way. There is no real attempt throughout the, the book to uh, get heavily into christianity and uh, you know establish it through preaching there are mentions of churches there are mentions of course of the graveyard there is there is there is a mention to a certain extent of the idea of the ethics of christianity and especially around around christmas time itself which is a christian festival but the the morality of religion and the morality of christian uh, 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 standards are not necessarily the core of what the book is all about which is curious because you'd expect that to be the case with with regard to uh, 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 this particular book but it, but it actually isn't secondly or thirdly 
what comes up very strongly is this 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 idea of redemption scrooge is redeemed at the very end he finds himself in fact pushed into the business of redemption because he really hasn't got a choice in the matter his alternative is to end up the per a person who when they die will be completely forgotten by everyone in other words their entire life will have been sold down the river towards the business of just being this corpse in a grave which nobody remembers and it's the terror of being this despised and unloved and neglected and dead end dead a life with a dead end that makes scrooge uh, change his mind and he has to be shown this and then shown this in the most brutal fashion possible by the various ghosts they twist his emotional tail they make him think again about his his childhood his growing up the way in which he operated in in in, in his contemporary the way in which he operates in his contemporary life and also where this is all going to lead him to in the business of the way in which his 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 goods and chattels are are stolen from him by the servants by the by the by the undertaker and by you know people who be kind of trusted almost the very curtains around his bed are taken and sold curtains around his bed that's an interesting one what are those curtains do they symbolize anything perhaps they symbolized scrooge's shield against the world his idea of being cut off from the world totally and when he wakes up and finally gets to know that you know there's more to life than the business of just being this horrid old miser the idea of the of the of the uh, uh, of the bed screen the bed sheets the bed hangings suddenly becomes something he no longer needs around him in in his in his bedroom he becomes part past that it's fascinating, isn't it, that the end of the book is in fact very short in comparison to the other staves. The book has a kind of arch shape in the which it's put together, focusing on stave four and three and four, and particularly the end of stave four, where the heart of the of the narrative is. It's in those particular staves where the the, the longest chapters are where the the most complex writing is and the early bit of the of the of the of the, of the book and the end bit of the book well the early bit is purely about the business of setting a setting a, a, a scene and the end of the book is really a very sharp you know summation of scrooge's transformation from you know this uh, t despicable old scroat <laughs> to being a person who's going to look for Christmas for the rest of his born days and going to support Christmas for the rest of his days and look after Bob Cratchit and his family. So what's the message here? The message is that Scrooge believes that the way forward is not so much for the state to intervene in the business of poverty. It's not for the business of, of, of people finding some sort of communal response to poverty. Dickens sees the, 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 the way of sorting this all out is by individual philanthropy in other words the idea that those who are rich have responsibility to support those who are poor and scrooge's endeavor as he promises at the very end of the book to look after bob cratchit is part and parcel of that message that's been made it's a curious early 19th century victorian attitude that this was not that poverty this solving the concepts of poverty in society was not a collective issue but an individualized one and i think that's one of the most interesting aspects of the book it's probably one of the reasons why stay five is so short because all state all, all it, what it's really about is scrooge promising that he's going to look after bob cratchit he's going to pay attention to his to his uh, his 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 nephew and and his and his wife he's going to start becoming part of the world again and giving to charity in other words there is no kind of campaigning work going on here scrooge not, doesn't really change his attitudes towards poverty he simply starts to recognize and become sympathetic towards it so you get an interesting 19th century early 19th century image of what you might call middle class attitudes towards poverty uh, and i think that's that is really interesting in the way in which it's pans out within the within the story lastly i mean the the, the 
the book is full of establishing concepts about Christmas which later become almost standard. You know, the idea of eating a fowl at, at Christmas, the idea of Christmas being an important uh, uh, feast in the in the in the air, the idea of 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 giving at Christmas time, are all established in the book. It has to be said that in the as I think I said earlier on in my series, Christmas up in the in the in the eighteenth and seventeenth centuries had not been a particularly popular um, uh, celebratory time. People had tended to ignore it for the most part, and certainly none of the the big, you know. Uh, 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 big celebration ideas that we now know take for granted were not part and parcel of the way in which uh, 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 early 19th century Victorians, uh, early 19th century people saw the period, that period of the year. So what you tend to find is that Christmas Carol establishes some of those traditions, establishing the idea of the joy of Christmas, establishing something about giving, and in that process of doing that associates charity with the festive season associates cold weather and dark Victorian avenues and the idea of of ghostliness with Christmas associates the whole business of looking after one's fellow man at Christmas as being part and parcel of that particular tradition the business of eating goose or turkey or whatever it happens to be at Christmas is part and parcel of the, of the book uh, the whole business of having the day off is part and parcel of the book the idea that that's an entitlement from the business of a, of a as part of the gift of a an employer to an employee comes over very strongly in the book too, and you what you tend to find in, throughout all this is is how important those those issues because of the popularity of the book became more and more and more and more part of the Christmas tradition, even though they hadn't been before. Add on to that, you know, Queen Victoria and Albert's importation of the idea of the Christmas tree itself. Uh, the development of Christmas as a as a commercial venture in which it was possible to to have selling in terms of buying presents and buying accoutrement for the Christmas season, such as the food and the drink that goes with it and the various traditions that one has to spend money on. This whole process of the book and its um, how it creates the background upon which modern Christmas is, is has developed strikes me as a really important aspect of, of why this book is still worth looking at, even you know, even now after its popularity has become so vast. So there we have it. That's the book as a whole. It's a belter of a book. I've really enjoyed reading it. I can talk about it over and over again, as you probably guessed. And I think that's probably all I need to say about it at this stage. Thank you so much for your support and listening to it all. Thank you so much for putting up with some of the problems that I've had in recording and how I've improved as time has gone on and all the rest of it that goes with the business of, 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 of reading A Christmas Carol. And... Once again, as I said to you last time, and I'm going to say it all over again, have a very, very Merry Christmas, and God bless us, everyone. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>